so much for joining us this evening, especially on a school night. Uh, late for some of us and the, you know, not so late for others. I'm glad that you're uh, here to speak with us a little bit about the new virtual clinical exam that we have planned for you for 2021. Uh, before proceeding, I really want to acknowledge that while uh, this presentation is being brought to you by myself and my partners, uh, Maggie Barnes Albrand and Kelly Piazantine, there are many other staff members and board members and volunteers uh, who've really given very generously both of their time and of their brain power uh, and thinking time. Uh, to help make this happen. So I just really wanted to acknowledge that, that this is the work of many individuals, hard work and commitment of many individuals. So big thank you to all of you who helped make this happen. So in the next 40 minutes, Kelly, Maggie and I will uh, try to cover all of these topics, talking about the process of how we came to create the new exam, talking about the model and what we envision it, it being, and really spending quite a bit of time talking about content validation uh, and delivery so that you really have a good sense of what this is going to look like in action and feel comfortable with that. Uh, and hopefully feel comfortable answering any questions that come to you after this webinar is or this town hall is over. Um, we'll also spend a little bit of time talking about the communication piece, which is really about education and orientation of candidates uh, so that we know and we can feel confident that the candidates are really well prepared uh, as they go into this exam, because that's going to be an important part of its validity. And then in the end, we're going to spend some time answering some frequently heard questions. These are things that have been coming to us through emails, uh, through postings on our website, you know, through the ether, through conversations. Uh, and I think that they're worth addressing with all of you. In the meantime, as you're listening, if you have questions of your own that you'd like answered, please use the question and answer feature. Uh, of the Zoom uh, platform rather than the chat line. We're not going to be monitoring the chat line, uh, so don't use that one. I know that that's a popular way to go, but please use the Q&A function. Uh, and we'll get to those questions as well at the end. I think we'll have plenty of time to answer questions. Okay, so to, to begin with, what I'd like to do is first talk about the process. How did we get here? Uh, when the CAPR Board of Directors made the decision uh, at the end of September to cancel the November 2020 clinical exam, we moved immediately to pull together an advisory committee uh, that would bring together people who are really well versed in virtual exams and the assessment of candidates at a distance, uh, in distance learning, uh, and things of that nature. We really wanted to create this advisory committee as a brain trust that would serve as a hub and spoke model where we would bring ideas to this group and in turn feed their input out to our broader stakeholder uh, population um, and create this the model together uh, in a way that made sense for everybody. So you'll see in the middle in this diagram that we do have our uh, innovation advisory committee working with us on a regular basis and seeking input from everybody else uh, around it. Uh, in particular, uh, seeking input from regulators, registration staff, and regulatory councils because without your input and without your comfort in what we're doing with this exam, it's not going to be possible. Uh, the final decision-making authority for this work rests with the CAPR Board of Directors, uh, but we're trying to be as comprehensive and as thorough as possible and seeking uh, external input. I do want to acknowledge the members of the advisory committee because they've been a huge help to us. We have Chris Boudram from the Yukon and Brandy Green from Saskatchewan as two very dynamic board members who are helping us. Mark Hall, uh, from Alberta is both a board member and involved with the University of Alberta Physiotherapy Training Program. Allison Grieg and Bernie Martin um, from UBC and uh, University of Alberta respectively have also been a huge help. 
Uh, and they have the added benefit of working with internationally educated folks through bridging programs and exam prep programs. So we're getting a, a great deal of input from them. Uh, and we have a recent graduate. We weren't able to include a student on the advisory committee because the students haven't taken the exam just yet. Uh, so the next best thing was to include, include a recent grad, in this case, an internationally educated one, uh, to help provide the input of, of someone who has recently taken the exam. So the first thing uh, that we needed to do together with the advisory group, uh, one of our very first tasks was to, to decide very quickly at the high level conceptualization of what this modified exam might look like. So I'm just going to go over this at a high level at this point, and then Maggie and Kelly will tell you a lot more about the details. So we knew very early on that this exam really had to be a virtual exam if it was going to survive in a COVID world. There were too many risks of thinking of any other type of an exam uh, because of the dependencies on facilities and because of the dependencies on standardized patient programs and their concerns of being in actually in the same physical location as examiners and as our candidates. So we moved quickly to a virtual model. We envisioned using something like Enterprise Zoom, something very similar to what we're doing now, and using the breakout room functions on Zoom to be able to run the virtual exam. And we knew that because we had a lot of people that we needed to assess in 2021, that the exam would need to be offered more frequently than in a typical year. Um, and we would need to run it over both a Saturday and a Sunday. Um, so those are all really important things to us straight away. And we'll talk about each of those in more detail as we continue. The other piece that we knew was really important was we had a really aggressive timeline. So we knew that we had to turn this around and create a brand new type of an exam before March. Uh, we really only had until the end of this year, of this month, uh, to get everything underway uh, so that we would have enough time to educate candidates and help them prepare for the exam. To be able to meet that aggressive timeline, we needed to take advantage of the innovative uh, of the innovations that were already underway together with our board and the an analytics that had been completed early in 2021 before the pandemic uh, to help us inform future changes to the exam. Only instead of having those innovations take place over three years, they're taking place over a three month period. Um, so that was an important aspect of how we've been able to pull this together. So just before handing it over to Kelly and Maggie uh, for their more in-depth view of what's happening, I thought I would share this picture. This picture's worth a thousand words. So this is a, um, a graphic dis uh, depiction of how the exam is going to look. So this little circle here, this pod, is a group of six candidates who are going to come together at any particular point in time uh, through Enterprise Zoom. And each candidate will be assigned a separate breakout room where the examiner and the standardized patient will already be waiting. So that's these separate circles around the bigger pod. Each candidate will have been reviewed previously through uh, a virtual proctor uh, to make sure that they are who they say they are. And that virtual proctor using artificial intelligence or supplemented by artificial intelligence will continue to monitor them as they move through each of these breakout rooms throughout the course of the exam. We are going to be using SimIQ, which is a technical platform built on top of Enterprise Zoom that makes movement through these breakout rooms automatic so that we don't use time, don't lose time through manually uh, creating these progressions. So that's the, a, a high level overview of what the exam is gonna look like or what the delivery of the exam is gonna look like. And now I'll turn it over to Kelly, who will tell you a little bit more about the content of the virtual exam. Thanks, Katya. All right, so when we first made the decision to pivot our focus to 
a virtual exam, our first task was to brainstorm the conceptualization of the exam and whether or not we would recommend fundamentally changing the structure and format of the exam. For example, doing away with the OSCE style exam and instead um, creating a completely uh, oral exam. But it was agreed upon by, um, through our consultation with the advisory committee members and CAPR staff that redesigning an exam was not in our best interest for both pragmatic and validity reasons. Uh, with the exam taking place in a matter of months, we simply don't have time to redesign our content and develop and validate this assessment content. Um, so we recognize that the 2021 clinical exam will necessarily require some adaptations in order to administer it in a virtual environment, but we are committed to following a format and using content that is as close as possible to the original clinical OSCE-based exam, and it's going to adhere to the PCE blueprint. So those are the foundational principles that we're working from. Next slide, please. So in terms of changes to the content and structure of the clinical component, we will be reducing the number of stations assessed from 16 to 12. We're also going to be removing the written portion of the five plus five minute stations. And we're removing the number of stations criterion whereby candidates are required to pass a minimum number of stations. Uh, candidates will still be required to receive an overall total score across all stations that meets or exceeds the passing score, and they still must demonstrate safe and professional actions and behaviors as indicated by our critical incidence criterion. And another obvious change that we are no, is that we're no longer going to be able to evaluate hands-on assessment or hands-on treatment simply because the candidate will not be in the same room as the standardized client, so cannot touch them. On the next slide, uh, Meg is going to be speaking more about the competencies that will be assessed on the virtual exam. I just wanted to make one more point though before I pass the torch to Maggie. I wanna point out that the first three changes uh, noted on this slide, so the um, reducing the number of stations, removing the written portion, and removing the number of stations criterion, those three changes have actually been in the works as part of our innovation plan long before COVID was a thing. And we had already been analyzing data to evaluate the merits of each of these changes as to whether or not they would better serve the needs of the PCE and how we assess candidates while maintaining the psychometric defensibility of the exam. All right, Maggie. Thank you. I'm just going to, sorry. I just lost my notes. There we go. So, sorry folks. Um, so as Kelly mentioned, the content of the clinical component exams in 2021 will be very close to those uh, exams that we've run before. For example, they're not oral exams, but they're, they contain the same clinical encounters that candidates would have encountered themselves in, a, in an in-person exam. And now they'll just play, take place in a virtual environment. So again, the exams are matched to the PCE blueprint. Um, they'll continue to test a representative sample of entry-level physiotherapy competencies. Our board of directors, the registrars, the Clinical Component Innovation Advisory Group, along with the Clinical Test Development Group, who are the content expert station writers, have all agreed that the vast majority of these skills can be assessed in a virtual environment. Now, these include those listed on the screen. Um, there, there are some skills and competencies, though, that we totally understand cannot be assessed using a virtual model. And these include the hands-on performance of certain assessment or treatment techniques. However, the higher level understanding of the processes and principles of these skills, you know, how and when to use them and how to interpret the results, can totally be assessed in other ways during the exam and are still going to be part of the content. Um, and if you can advance the slide, Kelly will take it on from here. So how are we going to be um, demonstrating evidence of the validity and reliability of our exam score interpretations? What processes will we be following? So this slide lists some of the ways that we are collecting evidence um, for the validity of the virtual exam. First of all, we're going to be using stations from our bank that are appropriate to run in a virtual medium and have already demonstrated acceptable psychometric performance on previous administrations. Uh, 
For some stations, we do have to make modifications and adaptations to ensure they're viable and fair to administer in a virtual settings. But all station content is being reviewed and modified by a national panel of physiotherapy content experts, whose role is to ensure that the exam is a fair and representative assessment of clinical competence at an entry to practice level. We're also collecting and integrating feedback from recent graduates and examiners with regards to how performing and scoring an OSCE station virtually differs from performing or scoring it in person. I'm gonna talk a bit more about the process we've actually um, completed in terms of collecting feedback from our recent graduates on the next slide. Um, but one more thing um, in terms of candidate orientation. So we are planning a robust orientation for candidates to provide them with information that will help them prepare for the virtual exam. Things like what to expect, what is different, and any other detail that will be relevant to ensure that the mode of the exam delivery does not impede their ability to demonstrate their competence on exam day. So in terms of the feedback we've collected from recent graduates, we actually conducted interviews with eight newly practicing physiotherapists in November. We um, recruited participants from our database of candidates who passed the clinical component in November 2019. We um, interviewed four Canadian educated and four internationally educated physiotherapists. And what we did was we selected three practice stations that have been retired from CAPR's bank in order to collect feedback from these participants on how performing an OSCE station virtually would differ from performing it in a traditional environment. So we met with participants um, individually, Maggie as a PT advisor playing the role of a standardized client and myself as the, the examiner, um, really I was just observing. And what we did was we had them go through each station. We timed them. Um, we let them read the instructions to candidate for a one minute if it was a five minute station, two minutes if it was a 10 minute station. Then the clinical encounter began. Followed, following the clinical encounter, uh, we then um, asked some structured interview questions for the participants. For instance, what was different? What was more challenging? What did they have to adapt? Was anything easier to perform in a virtual environment? What modifications or additions to the instructions to candidate would have made it easier or clearer to understand the tasks? Did they make any assumptions about the case presentation? And is there anything they felt would, they'd not be able to do in a virtual environment? So we've now um, collected and collated all this feedback and based on this feedback, we're using it to help inform our decisions about adaptations that should be made to our station content to ensure they're clear and that each station task can be performed virtually. Um, these insights that we gained from our graduates are also helping us target our training and orientation to ensure a fair and consistent experience for all candidates. And uh, in terms of um, exam reliability now. So some people have questioned whether a 12 station exam will be real realistic. And this was also a concern we explored when we first started considering whether it was appropriate to reduce the number of stations we administer. So we did analyze data from our past examinations to determine the psychometric impact of reducing the number of stations from 16 to 12. And our data has shown that we still meet the standards for acceptable reliability for performance-based assessments based on using 12 stations. Uh, with the virtual exam, um, we're able to actually augment the extent to which we can evaluate our exam reliability because we're now able to record stations for the first time as candidates perform in the stations. And this has two benefits. First, it allows us to conduct inter-rater reliability studies by having a second examiner independently score candidates after the exam day by watching a recording of the clinical encounter. It also allows us to investigate irregularities that might happen during the exam or if there's instances where say a candidate fails on the critical incidence criteria, we're able to review the recording to help our board of examiners assess whether a safety flag should be upheld. So in many ways, the virtual exam is actually going to expand our ability to analyze data in ways that we haven't been able to in the past. So I personally, as a psychometrician, I'm very excited about this opportunity. Maggie, on to you. Perfect, thanks. Um, so where are we now? So we're finalizing contracts with vendors for the proctoring and virtual exam administration platform, as Katya mentioned before. Um, we're employing a partnership approach to validation and delivery of the exam. 
Uh, we have three confirmed dates, as you see, um, for 2021, and we're working with the exam sites to try and uh, to work out the exact dates for another administration sometime in the late summer or fall of 2021. And the model still uh, employs an examiner and, and a standardized client in each of the stations. And so we're also working with our sites to secure these across the country. Can you advance the slide? Thanks. So we anticipate, and we've heard from our advisory group and other stakeholders that significant uh, time is going to be needed to orient and educate the candidates about uh, how to approach a virtual a touchless exam. And for certain skills, certain skills, candidates are used to demonstrating their competence using hands-on techniques and tactile cues for assessment, treatment, and even teaching uh, the standardized clients. And now they're going to need to employ more verbal communication skills with demonstration to complete the tasks required in the clinical encounters uh, without losing too much time. And so this is why we pilot test the stations and why, um, in fact, using the virtual medium and why we ran focus group interviews using uh, practice stations to identify any barriers to performance in the stations, how best to modify the station content and instructions, how to direct the candidates through the exam on the day and what content to include in pre-exam orientation material. So we, we know that significant steps are going to be needed to orient candidates to the exam model, especially with the hard to reach groups, the IEPTs and the physiotherapy residents who aren't linked to an academic program any longer. We're working on the content and the delivery models uh, right now for, for those education uh, pieces. And we plan to incorporate multiple delivery models and methods to ensure that the message gets to all the candidates. Um, we also really note the importance of reinforcing to candidates the difference between a traditional OSCE delivered in a virtual environment, which is what this is, and an exam that includes assessment of telehealth skills. Telehealth is not yet identified among the skills required at entry to practice for physiotherapy in Canada. And so therefore that's not going to be part of the exam. Um, and Kelly will take it from here, or no, I think we have the, the FAQs now. So back to Katja. Okay, so now we're gonna address a series of questions. I think there's seven or eight questions that we've been hearing uh, quite a bit in the ether or from people who speak to us about the exam. Again, I'm just gonna remind you, if you have your own questions, please feel free to use the Q&A feature to type them in and we'll get to them at the end. So the first frequently asked or frequently heard question has to do uh, with the level of ongoing risk of COVID. And it basically asks us, what contingency plans do we have in place if this new COVID proof exam isn't ready or can't run in March. And so there's quite a few levels of risk in this question that I thought I would cover. Um, and the, and the back, backup plans that we're creating should these things come to pass. So the most important risk, I think, is whether or not the exam will be ready in time. And that's something uh, that I think we've adequately addressed. As both Kelly and Maggie have already mentioned, uh, the content is just about finished because we're using pre-existing stations that have uh, item validity and item statistics already associated with them. They already have training videos that are created for them. Uh, we're able to modify them to make them appropriate for the virtual exam in the virtual world. We're able to modify them uh, for virtual delivery and making sure they're not too complicated. Uh, for a virtually delivered exam, but they're pretty much ready to go. Um, and similarly, because the work that we're doing to relaunch this exam is based on innovation and analytics that was underway long before COVID hit, uh, we have a really solid psychometric foundation uh, for running this exam the way that we're planning to. So the, the risk of it not being ready for, uh, for March is actually quite low. Another very high risk, of course, has to do with facilities uh, and the accessibility of facilities. Toronto, where we are, is currently in full lockdown mode. I think Alberta is, has either already followed suit or will shortly. So are other provinces. 
So that risk is being dealt with by the fact that nobody has to travel to a facility to take this exam. Every candidate, every examiner, and every standardized patient will be in their own happy place wherever they feel safe and comfortable taking the exam. They do not need to come together in a room. They will all be separate and, and in their own virtual spaces. And so that risk is also no longer applicable. So that's those are all very, I think, positive things that we've done to be able to protect this exam uh, from future cancellations. Another area of risk that uh, we are concerned about and that we are very thoughtful about has to do with technological failure. In particular, the concern about internet outages and whether or not the students, the candidates, will be able to take the virtual exam without their Zoom crashing because that would be devastating and very demoralizing. So there's a number of things that we've done to ensure, or not to ensure, but to try to limit the risk of technological failures. So the first is that the SimIQ platform that we're going to be using is a very robust, it is a well-used well, um, platform with a great deal of experience with both licensure and uh, formative exams for medical schools. Through thousands of exam administrations that SimIQ has done in Canada and in the United States, they've only had a, a handful of technological failures, so we believe that that's promising. An important part of addressing this risk is working very closely with candidates to ensure that they know what they need in terms of hardware uh, and in terms of their setup to be able to experience this exam in a safe and highly reliable way. Now, a lot of the candidates who are taking this exam virtually will have already have taken the written exam through virtual proctoring, so they will have gone through this. And so they know what, uh, what equipment they need and how to uh, lock into um, a wired Ethernet connection to decrease the likelihood of Internet outages. For those who haven't done that, we're going to have educational videos and information and a practice sessions for them available through our website so they can test things out ahead of time. We also mentioned earlier in this presentation um, that the exam is going to run over a Saturday and a Sunday. We've actually separated things out so that the candidates are all taking their 10-minute stations on Saturday and then coming back and taking their five-minute stations on Sunday. One of the reasons we're doing that is because then the length of time that they have to be online is significantly shorter. One of the lessons that we've learned from some of our exam world partners is that if you have a long exam, if the candidate has to be online for six or seven or eight hours, as been the case for some other organizations, the likelihood of internet outages really, really increases. So by splitting the exam over the two-day period, we're going to have the candidates online for maybe two hours on Saturday and probably closer to an hour on Sunday. And so their ability to maintain a solid internet connection will really increase with that split. Finally, there is a risk about what might happen. We're still dependent on standardized patients for this exam. Those um, those are the people acting out the vignettes for each of the stations that the candidate goes through. Even though the standardized patients will be safe and they won't be touched by candidates, so we think their anxiety will go down, it is possible that the standardized patient program itself might be shut down if a university uh, is directed through their own uh, jurisdictional public health directives to shut down completely. Standardized patient programs are under the purview of a dean at the university, at least most of them are. And if that dean decides that he has to or she has to shut down the program, um, then the likelihood of our ability to access standardized patients might be affected. What we're doing as a backup plan in that regard is that as part of our examiner recruitment, we are asking examiners whether they would be willing to also serve as standardized patients. This is a practice that we've seen uh, in physiotherapy training programs that it's used there frequently, and I think it could be very successful in this regard. Uh, and so the backup plan there, there is then to train up uh, some of the folks, the physiotherapists who have volunteered to be examiners, instead of being an examiner, they would be trained up to be a standardized patient. So that's how we're trying to manage risk 
uh, in terms of possible ongoing challenges due to COVID. I'll, I'll say one more thing, I'm sorry. The other area of risk is that, you know, God willing, everything ends up being okay and COVID doesn't continue throughout the course of the year. And if that happens, the question then becomes, what happens then? Are we gonna continue with the virtual exam or do we go back to the old system if everything is hunky-dory by June? And so we've made the decision that we're gonna run all of the exams in 2021 with this virtual approach. We will not change courses midstream. We will do um, have a consistent approach for everybody that needs to take this exam in 2021 and then partway through the year, we'll make a decision together with our board of directors with what the approach will be going forward in 2022. The second question that we frequently hear um, from candidates as well as regulators has to do with the numbers of people that we're gonna be able to assess. What are the plans for managing uh, the increased numbers, the increased uh, load of candidates that we're gonna have to assess in 2021? Well, what we're gonna do, as I mentioned previously, is we're gonna run the exam more frequently than we normally do. And with the Saturday-Sunday split, we're able to increase volumes to get more candidates through uh, in 2021. By doing this, normally we run, I think all of you know, normally we run the exam only twice in June and then in November and only on a single day, only on a Saturday or a Sunday, but not both. So by adding the two days per exam administration and running it twice as often as we normally would, we'll be able to increase our volumes. And it's our goal to uh, assess everybody, both in the uh, from the two cohorts, from the 2020 backlog and anybody new from 2021. These are the approximate numbers of candidates that we think we'll be able to assess within each administration. So our first administration in March will be smaller. The reason we're doing that is because we want to test out the platform, we want to test out the approach, and as with any major change, we want to make sure that the glitches are worked out before we double the capacity and run it for a much larger group of candidates uh, starting in June. So these are, uh, these are approximations. They should not be taken literally, but this is our goal. This is what we're aiming for, and this is how we're planning to run the exam so that we can assess both cohorts in 2021. The third question that we've been starting to hear much more frequently of late has to do with the costs of running the clinical exam. And we've been asked, will candidates receive a rebate? There seems to be a perception, a pretty widespread perception, that running a virtual exam is much less expensive than running an on-site exam. Uh, and so candidates would like for us to return part of their money. I think that's a reasonable request, uh, but the fact or the, the perception that an exam, a virtual exam is cheaper, less expensive than an in-person exam is a myth. It is not less expensive to administer the exam virtually than it is to administer the exam in a facility. The reason for this has to do with the fact that the biggest part of our costs in running the exam has to do with the number of examiners and the number of standardized patients that we have to employ and that we have to train. In fact, the training hours are going to be much higher for a virtual exam because not only do the examiners and the standardized patients need to learn their station, they need to learn how to work the station in a virtual environment. So our costs for examiners and standardized patients will, will remain, and that is the bulk of what we, uh, what we have to pay for when we're running the exam. There will be administrative savings. There's no question about that. We don't need hall monitors. We don't need to be mailing out props. There's other savings uh, that we'll encounter, but those administrative savings will be, uh, will be countered almost dollar for dollar by the increased costs that we're gonna be incurring to purchase and administer the technological platform. So for the virtual proctoring service and for the technological capabilities offered by SimIQ. Um, so it's gonna come out a wash. We've just finished preparing our budget and the numbers are almost identical. 
What will happen though, is that the candidates will save money on their end. Many, many candidates have to travel to take the clinical exam when it was offered and only in particular sites. And many of them had to then book lodgings the night before or the night after, uh, before traveling back home. So those savings will definitely exist for candidates. Uh, and we're happy that um, that'll be a lot easier and less expensive for them uh, during this time. The fourth question that we hear quite frequently is one that I'm gonna hand over to Kelly, and it has to do with alternatives to the way that we score the exam and the way that passing criteria are set within each administration or other alternatives. Oops, sorry, Kelly. That's okay. Um, so to answer the question um, whether or not CAPR has considered alternatives um, instead of requiring candidates to take the clinical exam, for instance, those who've previously failed it, um, allowing those people who may be failed by one station to pass, or accepting um, employer assessments or you know, clinical placement assessments as a functional equ equivalent. These have been considered, but it's important to recognize that these are actually regulatory decisions. And we've been in constant contact with regulators and regulatory councils all throughout um, since you know, COVID started to really uh, make decisions. Um, because there is a viable and valid alternative available for assessing candidates during the pandemic, board direction has been to proceed with the clinical exam, albeit now in a, a virtual one. Uh, next slide, I catch you. Um, this slide is posted on our website, I believe, and it's just an illustration of what CAPR does and does not do. Um, just to remind people, because there is confusion about what we have control over um, as an organization. Uh, in terms of accepting supervised clinical practice hours as evidence of safe and effective practice, um, it's important to keep in mind that the practice of physiotherapy does vary widely around the world. And this exam is taken by people um, from across not only Canada, but across the globe. And for example, in some countries, a physiotherapist can't make a diagnosis. They can't decide on when to discharge a patient. And it would pose risk to the public if we were to accept supervised clinical practice hours worked in the health system of a different country as evidence. Um, next slide, Katya. Uh, so this next slide, I wanted to speak about our role in the exam um, as, a, as a CAPR staff member. So our role is to ensure um, psychometric defensibility of the exam, ensure a high quality assessment of the exam program, and also to ensure consistency across administrations. So for candidates who are saying that they should be licensed because they only failed by one station, it's important to recognize that they were not actually close to high performing candidates because the passing score is a threshold for minimal competence. And for every high stakes exam, there has to be a cut score, which is a line in the sand that separates candidates who have demonstrated minimal competence from those who have not. And for the 16 station physical, sorry, physiotherapy competency exam, um, CAPR's board of directors determined that candidates must meet three criteria to pass it. So the total score, the number of stations and critical incidents. Um, and so, and based on the format and the content of the 16 station assessment, it was determined that those three criteria in combination would allow us to infer that candidates who passed the exam have demonstrated a minimum standard of competence, including depth and breadth of required physiotherapy knowledge and skill and safe and professional conduct. So in, two, in 2021, a new exam will be administered, one that's going to use a different set of stations and a different format for testing clinical competence. As such, a new passing standard is appropriate for this new assessment. Um, and we've had to make determinations about whether or not the same three criteria would be appropriate. It was determined though that using the number of stations criterion for the 12 station exam does not yield optimal reliability around the cut score. So we decided that we're no longer gonna be using the number of stations criterion for the 12 station exam, but there's no justification for removing the criterion from previous exams. So we can't go backwards because those criteria were valid for the previous assessment and we're not going to go and change it. Uh, the next question that we often get is about, um, are we going to evaluate the new exam? And if so, how? And the answer is yes, we actually evaluate the psychometric performance of every exam after it's administered, which is a requirement requirement for establishing exams reliability and validity. Um, on the next slide though, I will talk about 
the robust evaluation um, program that we are looking into developing for 2021 to evaluate the exam's efficiency, feasibility, reliability, validity, and fairness. So the domains that we're going to be explore, exploring will include all aspects of virtual delivery, including the experiences of st key stakeholders, so including CAPR staff, examiners, standardized patients, volunteers, candidates. We're going to be assessing the exam results and scores and the psychometric performance of the stations and the exam as a whole. Um, the evaluation proposal is currently being developed and the details will be confirmed by the end of January 2021 in terms of the exact evaluative model. Um, and we expect that this evaluation will occur throughout 2021 and it's going to be completed after the last exam. So the evaluation will no, not just be for the March exam, but for the entire year. Another question that we frequently hear from people, or at least we did earlier on, not as much right now, is why did it take five months for the CAPR to come to the realization that it wouldn't be able to run the exam in November? Uh, and why did we wait until March, until 2021, to begin work on the virtual exam? The short answer to this question is we didn't. This is actually a, mis um, a misunderstanding of the work that was going on. There was a great deal of work going on behind the scenes to consider alternatives from the very beginning of the pandemic. I think the first time that we discussed the possibility of a second wave and how it would impact our delivery of both our written and our clinical exams was probably during uh, a meeting with our registrars in April and then with our board in June. Keeping in mind our guiding principles to do make decisions that are the most fair for the most number of people, at that point in time, the board decided that we needed to prioritize, if we're gonna do anything virtually, we really needed to prioritize the written exam because it's the written exam that allows students and IEPTs to get into practice in Canada and get the clinical ex experience and expertise that they need in order to pass the clinical exam and achieve independent licensure. So that was our number one priority. This slide shows you a little bit of the timeline and uh, talks a little bit about the work that was going on behind the scenes as we considered all of the options available to us. So as I said, initially the decision of the board was to focus on the creation of a virtually proctored written uh, exam, which we delivered starting in August. Uh, and at the same time, we were focusing on how to make the clinical exam safe. At that point in time, we had received um, we had received assurances from our programs and our facilities that there wouldn't be any problems uh, with the, running the clinical exam at the at the facilities that we had contracts with. Because we wanted to be careful with the situation, because we knew of the likelihood of a second wave coming in the fall, we began work on backup plans, the use of hotels, the use of alternative settings for the clinical exam, and that work was well underway. We also already at that point in time, beginning in the summer of 2020, uh, began our work to modify our approach to the clinical exam removing the written station components to it to make the exam safer, uh, changing up the stations that would be used to make sure that the candidates didn't need, have to do anything that was unsafe in a, at a time of COVID, uh, ensuring that we had enough personal protective equipment for all of our examiners, all of our uh, standardized patients, and that the students and candidates were aware that they would all need personal protective equipment and things of that nature. So we had made those modifications and we were moving uh, forward with our centers and with our standardized patient programs together with the backup plans all throughout till the end of the summer. It's important, it looks very different from this point in time now that it's December, but if you cast your mind back to August, things looked pretty good at that point in time. And so uh, the, the feasibility of running a clinical exam changed very, very quickly. So on September 2nd, September 3rd, as we were starting uh, you know, our fall world, we were still pretty confident that we would be able to run the exam, at least at certain centers, if not all of them. By September 10th, that had changed completely and the dominoes began to fall. 
uh, indicating the closure of one center after the next. I think one of the main considerations for actually making the decision to cancel the November exam uh, when the board met at the end of September was actually one uh, that took into uh, account the mindset and the mental health of our candidates. What we really wanted to avoid at all cost was pressing forward with the November exam at hotels, at convention centers, wherever we could, only to have that exam canceled at the very last minute. I had spent some time talking with candidates and I asked them, what is worse for you? Is it worse to wait even longer until March to get your independent license? Or is it worse for you to continue to prepare for the exam and have it be canceled the night before? And unequivocally, the feedback came back that, that the latter scenario, the cancellation of exam the night before or two days before the exam uh, would be devastating. And in fact, we've seen that happen with other exam organizations. So I really think that we made the right decision in doing what we did. Uh, and, and, and looking forward in terms of um, what we're able to do now in a really interesting and innovative way. The last question that I think I'd like to focus on before turning it over to you is how can you help? We'd like to get the whole physiotherapy profession involved uh, in helping run this exam because it's for the good of the whole profession. So number one, if we're gonna run this exam for 3000 candidates, we're gonna probably need more examiners uh, than we would normally recruit. Some of our areas of uh, Canada uh, have a harder time recruiting examiners than others do. And so we would ask that each one of you help recruit examiners. We do have an um, examiner recruitment form up on our website and it clarifies the requirements of examiners. And we encourage you to consider uh, working with us as an examiner um, for this exam. Uh, in particular, if we need to use examiners as standardized patients as well this year. The other area where I'm hopeful that we can all work together has to do with the sourcing of locations for those candidates who are going to have challenges finding a place to take the exam with stable internet. We know um, that both our internationally educated and our Canadian educated physios, our candidates, live in widely diverse settings. Some of them have young children at home. Some of them live with roommates who are hogging the internet, um, either for their own school reasons or for Netflix or gaming or for whatever reason. Others live in multi-generational homes. All of these candidates are going to have some challenges finding a safe place to take the exam. We are not going to have the capacity as an organization to help broker uh, the location where candidates can take the exam, but I'd like to begin a conversation with you and with other partners about whether or not you know of a facility that could offer a quiet room with stable internet where the candidate might come to take the exam if their home situation isn't a viable alternative. We had thought that we might be able to do this with hotels, but hotels don't have a private internet line, and so we're gonna have security and firewall issues, so that's not gonna be an option. So I'd like to keep talking about this as a, as a possibility. Um, we don't know how many candidates are gonna have trouble with stable internet, and as I said, we're doing everything we can to mitigate those concerns, but if you have any ideas in this regard, we'd, lo uh, we'd love to hear from you.